these models just ooze imagination, charm and inspiration. It makes me want to build a small NCB diorama. Hi there to you, I hope I find you well. Welcome back to the channel. I'm Jennifer Kirk, welcoming you back up into the loft here on Weir Yard. And today we're gonna to be reviewing a product from Happens Originals. Now this is one of the Andrew Barclay four-wheeled shunter locomotives, which came out to immense fanfare a couple of years ago now. And you might remember that we reviewed the CPC liveried one, which actually sold out. Um, it was a massive, massive hit. But at the moment Happens has got a sale on with these and I thought I'd take the opportunity to pick one up and take another close look at these one of the different liveries and different detail variants actually and uh, we've got an affiliate link in the description box down below if you two want to go and find these on the Hattons website but come with me in association with today's channel sponsor Trainomatic makers of DCC decoders and accessories that are designed by enthusiasts for enthusiasts. And of course, uh, towards the end of this video, we will also do a full DCC fitting guide for this model using one of the Trainomatic decoders suitable for this. And I'll talk you through the entire process of how to very, very easily fit this high quality decoder to your own locomotive uh, without any kind of issues. So stay tuned for that, but come with me and I'm really looking forward to showing you this model. I couldn't resist over the Christmas period taking full use of the Hatton's sale when it came to these Andrew Barclay locomotives. Now this is something that uh, you'll remember on the channel that when they first came out I was lucky enough to be able to get one of these CPC versions. Really really pleased with this. It's been a very reliable runner and it's continued to be a very reliable runner. You can see there it also featured in the Hardy's Hobbies review where we fitted it with a 3D printed locomotive crew. And I'm really really pleased with this. And as I said in the review then it's got a lot of weight to it and it just runs very very sweetly so really pleased when Hatton's reduced the prices on quite a few of their own models not just the Andrew Barclay but also the Southeastern and Chatham Railway P class as well and I just had to have one of these so it comes in the pretty standard Hatton's model railways box which is actually very reminiscent of the boxes uh, that Hellion models come in, but also Daypol as well. It's very, very strong. And I've always said this before, that this is something that, I know people poke fun of people who get excited by the box on, on YouTube, but hear me out here. If the box is well put together, what it shows is that it gives that vibe of a quality product. It's a product that the manufacturer is proud of, has put a lot of thought into, and if they're thinking about how well to package it in transit, then you're not really gonna go wrong with a lot of other things. We've got some, uh, uh, just a bit of information in here, maintenance information, but also very usefully, it's got information about how to get inside the model Although um, it is a little bit trickier than this makes out and you need some very, very careful choice of decoder. So if you stay tuned to the end of the video, we're gonna be doing a full DCC fit of this model using the Trainomatic Micro 6-pin direct plug decoder. Now it does fit just but what you'll, I think you'll find is that Hattons don't even recommend their own brand six pin decoder because the space is so tight in these. So um, I have tested it and the Trainomatic Micro six pin direct plug does fit. We've also got some information here on these uh, uh, vacuum pipes or it could be air pipes depending on what uh, this locomotive would have been employed with. So I'm not quite clear whether it would have been air or vacuum fitted, possibly both at various points in its life, but certainly earlier on to handle either the MCV or the MDV mineral uh, open wagons, it would have needed vacuum brakes. And then later on, as uh, merry-go-round hoppers, uh, things like the HEAs and HAAs turn up, 
would have needed air brakes. Um, but certainly it's nice that these extra details are there to match with your locomotive of choice. This is the extra detail pack that comes with the model and you can see there we've got the two slightly different brake standards there which can be fitted onto the buffer beam. You can see the two holes there to the, just to the left of the coupling and uh, ditto on the back. The instructions as I already showed you do show exactly which one's front and which one's back. And then we also have a couple of three link couplings attached to the uh, drawbar hooks which also fit to the buffer beam. Now my personal preference for these is for manufacturers to pre-fit the hook and just leave the three link chain for the user to apply. I think that aesthetically that works better for more modelers but they've chosen to do it this way around on this model. Patterns have a whole host of different uh, locomotives in the sale uh, of the uh, the Andrew Barclay type and I must admit I could have gone quite wild there's a lot of industrial liveries but also NCB liveries and there's a lot of rolling stock suitable for NCB liveried or themed layouts and it is a really rich vein of railway modeling which is there to be tapped and these locomotives really do tap into that so so well the first thing that's always very apparent is the weight on these they are a very very heavy locomotive and of course that does aid with the running characteristics and traction very very well even though it's a short wheelbase for coupled chassis now there was two NCB models in the sale. There was a, a number six, which was in a kind of a very light green color. And I'm always a, uh, a sucker for green liveries. But with, for me, the lining on this black one just sold it for me. And you can see there, even under very close magnification, it does look really, really nice. The actual lining itself is very straight and true. We've got the two different colours going on there. And I don't really see any issues with uh, waving or smudging on there at all. It's also the case that we've got things like these uh, uh, boxes on the side, running plate, they're all lined up as well. And it just all comes together in this really lovely package. You can see there as well, the front of those boxes is lined out as well. The front of the uh, very characteristic uh, high tank that the Andrew Barclays were fitted with, that's all lined out. And it just shows how much love there was for these locomotives back in the day. How much pride, not just their crews, but their owners as well, took in them. And this livery, probably more so than a lot of the other liveries, really does show that pride that there was in even nationalised industries back at the beginning. This here lettered up for the NCB, the National Coal Board. Number 10 in the Ayrshire area. Uh, quite often they would have their um, assignments, their ownership areas written on the bunker sides as well. You can see there on top of the filler on the water tank, the actual handle there, you can see my finger through that wire top. Really nicely done. I like these safety valves as well. You can see the spring assembly. And again, you can see right through where you need to see through. The actual funnel though, you can see there, there's a kind of big line where the actual funnel top um, goes down and onto it. It just seems a little bit um, coarse for me. You can just see there on the edge, the indentation. And it's just a shame that the funnel top is fastened on in that way. Um, it just seems quite a large groove. I can feel it there with the tip of my nail. Um, but um, everything else about that funnel is captured absolutely perfectly. You can see there on the front, the handrails, it's all metal handrails. Really quite robust. And the cab windows, they are flush glazed on the outside. But as you can see on the inside, we get this kind of bar of glazing, which is very, very obvious there on the back of the cab. Not quite so obvious on the front. Uh, and it's a bit of a shame because when you look in there, you can see just how much detail is on the back of the boiler there with separately finished and also separately applied bits of detail. And uh, that is actually really exquisite in there. You can just about there see 
that glazing bar across the front is a bit of a shame. One of the things which is uh, different from this version to some of the other versions, and I'm going to bring up actually the CPC version there, because this shows off one of the detail differences between different versions of the Andrew Barclay. The CPC has this uh, little cover there just to um, cover off the uh, swing of the brake winding handle. But this NCB one is without that, and I can only guess that some locomotives had them, some didn't. It may even be the case that some lost theirs later in life. But Hattons does have the means to uh, represent members of the, uh, the class which were slightly different over their lifespan. And you can see one of the other detail differences between these two is uh, that ladder on the side there, just there. And that is included on some models, but not on others, as per the prototypes. Now, uh, one of the things that's actually missing from uh, my CPC one is just that little pipe in there on one side. And uh, you'll see why I basically managed to trap it and break it um, when I DCC fitted my original one. But uh, it's as long as you're careful, it's not a problem, and I'll show you that in the actual DCC fitting guide. The connecting rods are really, really fine. They're all metal, and you can see there the representation of the oil fillers. I really like this uh, crosshead detail. Really robust, metallic, really nicely done. Now, there is also a difference in cylinder size between different versions. I think that these two are the same size cylinders, but uh, patterns do offer two of the different variants from the Andrew Barclay stable. So there's a whole host of different detail options between these, and um, patterns have to be applauded for tooling up for all of these. The chassis detail through that really is exquisite, and underneath the boiler as well. The way that these are put together, that it really does work so, so nicely in there. We've got the spring detail, and uh, it just really works so, so well. I'm uh, just looking in there. The, the spring for the front wheel is sort of um, right down in there. That's very low. But um, they've actually captured so many of the quirks of this class of locomotives so, so well. The closer you look into this, the more detail it has, but that lining really does bring out so much of the detail. We've got these uh, little uh, metal um, handrails at the top here. They're just sort of like posts, but which will be for the crew to grab onto to climb up. So nicely done and actually very, very robust because they're made of metal. And even with extensive handling, I've not had any real issues with um, bits falling off on these at all. The buffers are all fully sprung. Another detail option that you will see if you go to the affiliate links and have a look through the Hattons website of the ones that are on offer is that there's also two sizes of buffers um, that they offer, although both of these are the same smaller size of buffers. I'm going to turn now to the DCC fitting, so I'm going to bring on my trusty small screwdriver set. And as I said at the beginning of the review, the decoder which I recommend for these is the Trainomatic Micro 6-pin plugged. And we've got a link in the description box for Trainomatic as well, which takes you to their UK supplier, Tramfabrique, and you can buy the uh, appropriate decoders there. Now I'm going to pick out the really, really small jeweler's crosshead screwdriver and uh, we need to undo this screw here just behind the coupling and ditto for the one at the back. But once you've got both of these loose, don't just pull the chassis off because there is another stage to do just to make sure. And this is where things get just a little bit fiddly, it has to be said. So. Let's just get both of these screws out. And then what I choose is to get the very small flathead screwdriver. And what we're looking for, if you just see in there, that little bit there just pulls out. And actually what I'm gonna do with this 
what I actually found the best thing to do if you can is to just try and this is a bit fiddly just try and tuck this if you can out of way the way in this handy ladder now I didn't have this luxury with the CPC version which is why unfortunately one side got broken because the problem you find is it can catch and get just sheared off if you're not careful now we've got those loose so we're going to just wriggle and just pull down the chassis what you will probably find is that um, it will catch on something so we're going to have to go back in there you just can hook it in like that and it keeps it out of the way let's just uh, try again to get that onto the other side as well now nearly nearly yes and then looking to the bottom it's come out okay when we come to put this back in there's a couple of other detail bits that uh, we just have to be aware of so I'm going to put the body to one side now I already test fitted this so I will guide you through the fitting here. This is the Trainomatic Micro Decoder. Part of the problem with this comes that even though you've got all this space underneath, I'll just show you that there, the actual six pin plug is hard onto this circuit board here. So the total length from plug to this side here is very, very restricted. This decoder just fits, and I mean just fits. Uh, there are some other brands of decoders which do uh, fit in as well, but you will also find a lot of decoders don't. They're just slightly too long and won't go back in. Pin one is this side. Pin one and pin six are marked on the blanking plate, but when you come to insert the Trainomatic decoder, it's quite easy to do. You need the QC label facing upwards, line up the pins, and then just very carefully wriggle it in. Watch out as well for these two wires. You don't want them to get caught because it will push the decoder out far enough that you won't be able to get the top back on. And that's really all that it needs. If you want to go down the sound route, there is theoretically enough room for a very, very small iPhone type speaker, possibly underneath here. But again, it's a really, really tight fit and you have to constantly be aware on the space. Refitting this, we'd line the whole assembly up. And this is where there's two other bits, which when you're getting this out, don't actually seem to cause a problem. But putting it back in, we've got two detail parts, which we just need to move out of the way, loop on top. Same for this side as well. Just need to pull that out. And these aren't glued, they're just kind of push fit, interference fit. But there, once you've got it underneath, it's just a case of very, very gently rocking. That's just caught again. And you just need to make sure that uh, the wiring is going in. And like I said, it's a very, very tight fit, uh, almost an interference fit. And we're just going to make sure none of this detail is caught. And this does make it just a little bit of a more complex DCC fit. Getting the decoder in, really easy. Getting it put back together, that's the hard part. You just feel it, don't force it. Once it's in, we can, uh, in fact, what we'll do to stop it from just falling out, I'm just going to get these screws back in, and then we can just make sure that the detail 
it's back where it needs to be. Don't over tighten any of these screws. If you don't want to strip threads, don't force it in. If you find yourself forcing it, then there's probably something trapped and you'll break it. Um, but they just need to go in nicely fitted in place. We're not quite done yet. I told you this is a little bit, um, well, a lot more involved than most other DCC fitting that I've done. And this as well can be very, very tricky because we now have to very carefully line these up. And it's just a case of trial and error. Just to line those plugs up with the holes and then firmly push them back into place, which if like me, your eyesight is not as good as it used to be, this can be a very tricky and infuriating game of trial and error. And we're gonna get all these back into place and then we're ready to put this locomotive onto the track and get it running. And there we are. There's the DCC fit. It's not as easy as a lot of other models, but it's perfectly doable. Just follow the step-by-step -step process there. And um, anybody can do that. Just take your time and be careful. When it came to running, this locomotive ran pretty much flawlessly out of the box. I didn't have to adjust any of the uh, uh, pickup wipers on the backs of the wheels. They were all making contact quite nicely. I had it running on the DCC Concepts rolling road, and there did seem to be a couple of slight tight spots at the beginning, but 20 minutes of running in both directions did soon to start to smooth that out. So I wasn't really worried at all by that. On DCC, the control and response was uh, pretty responsive, actually. I was able to get this locomotive to run right down to a crawl. Although just be advised that with a very short four coupled chassis, then it's always going to be slightly prone to things like twists in track and insult frog points. But I actually wasn't unduly concerned with its performance and it did manage my layout pretty well. When it came to running on the gradients, again, there's a lot of traction from this locomotive helped by that immense amount of weight and a really good weight distribution. So I was really pleased with its performance. And as I said before, I've had that CPC liveried Andrew Barclay since they very first came out from Hatton's. And this has still running strong as good as the day that it first came out of the box. So I have no issues whatsoever with the longevity of these models. They will keep on chugging. So it comes to turn to the scores. First up is build quality. And I'm really, really pleased with how well these are put together. There was no loose detail parts on these. Everything has remained in place where it should, even with a great deal of handling. And also me taking it apart and putting it together, not once, but twice for that DCC fitting, once for the test run, and wants to show you guys how to do it. So I was quite pleased with all of that. It is a really tight fit on the components, but it's testament to the design and build quality of this that it still does reliably go back together without any great issue. All the parts do feel like they seat nicely and uh, positively, and uh, all of the running gear in terms of the wheels, the connecting rods, the crossheads, the slides, everything like that feels and looks nice and robust. So no real major flaws on this. So I'm going to give it a 9.9 .9 out of 10. When it came to running quality, the locomotive did seem to be pretty good out of the box, although it did benefit from around 20 minutes in each directions running in on the DCC concept rolling road. Once it was on the layout and DCC fitted, there were a couple of occasions where I just had to give it a little bit of a nudge. And it does feel that if you can fit a stay alive into this locomotive, then A, good luck to you, because there's not a lot of space in there, but B, it will just help it out. Even a small stay alive would just help to ease this over some of the twists in my slightly ropely laid track. 
But once you got this locomotive up to speed, it was quite happy. And actually, prolonged running did shine up the wheels and help it no end. Its pulling power was actually pretty good. And even over some of the gradients on my track, it didn't really show any signs of struggling with the loads that I threw at it. And I just found that it was um, really super bulletproof reliable. So for running qualities, I'm going to give this a 9.8 out of 10. When it comes to DCC fitting and innovation, it is a little bit of a tricky DCC fit. And there's not really any space in there for anything other than a hardened uh, boffin being able to fit the sound or the stay alive in. And I think if you're lucky enough to be able to find a way of fitting one, you're not really going to find the space for the other. And my thoughts with these are that actually a stay alive is probably the most useful. As you saw in the DCC fitting guide, it is probably more involved than 95% of the locomotives that I've reviewed on this channel. But if you're methodical and careful, then actually it's not impossible to get in there. And this isn't a locomotive that tries to punish one wrong move. As long as you follow that process, you will be just fine. But be very careful with your choice of DCC decoder. It needs a genuinely small one or you simply won't be able to get the top back on. So I'm going to give this an 8.0 out of 10. On accuracy and quality of finish, I really do like these models. There's not that much to fault. That glazing bar in the cab is probably the biggest niggle for me. But bear in mind that this locomotive has been out for a few years now, and we have been spoiled with the innovations that, in some ways, locomotives such as these were the trailblazers which made it possible. There's also that band on the funnel. And uh, I have to say that is probably the most noticeable thing for me. But is that really massively noticeable? I think if your eye is being constantly drawn to that, then you are blind to the charms that the rest of this locomotive has to offer. It is still, in my book, a minor detraction. And the fact that these locomotives are on sale at £84 does forgive an awful lot. And actually, there's not really much to forgive at all. So I'm going to give this a 10 out of 10, because really, look at that. Look at that lining. The works plates, everything is legible. It's crisp. It's clear. It's straight and true. It's where it should be. There's nothing in the wrong place. It oozes quality. And I think that 10 out of 10 is really well deserved. Finally, value for money. Again, at £84 for a small shunting locomotive, this is well in the ballpark of even some of the other really mega markdown value for money models that we've reviewed on this channel in the past. You're not going to get a loco this good for this kind of price anywhere else. And for that alone, this is getting a 10 out of 10 for value for money because it is a really good model at a really good price. This gives us a final score of 47.7, a deservedly great score. And I really love these models. If it doesn't inspire you into doing a small NCB themed layout, then really there is something wrong with you because these models just ooze imagination, charm and inspiration. It makes me want to build a small NCB diorama just to give this a permanent home. I love this model. I love this livery. And you know what? I do love these models. That's why this is my second. And I can see it won't be the last. There's so many great liveries on offer from Hattons for these that it's well worth going and having a look. Once a livery is sold out, it's gone. And you'll be kicking yourself for not getting in there sooner, as so many people did with the CPC livery. Well, I hope you really enjoyed that video. Don't forget as well that we've got some affiliate links that take you over to the Hattons website in the description box down below, where you can find these as well at the really keen price that I picked this one up for. And uh, don't forget as well, like, share and subscribe if you haven't already done so. And sharing is caring. It's a really great way that you can help out the channel by getting the content out there in front of as many people as possible. But until next time, you take great care of yourself. Happy morning. Modeling. This is me, Jenny Girk, saying bye for now. Today's video is sponsored by Trainomatic, 
Makers of DCC decoders designed to be fully compatible with every manufacturer's locomotive. Visit train-o-matic.com to browse the full range and see what they've got suitable for you. I'd like to send out a huge thanks to everybody who supports me on Patreon. And an extra special huge thanks goes out to Anthony Kidson, Michael Churchwood, Anthony Hunt, William Wade, Wayne Johns, Offshore Allen, oorail.co.uk, Tepic, Michael Lockie, Helen Sink, Peter Bolton, Brian and Dorothy Mudd, Gary Lewis, David Quinn, Sparky107107, George Butterini, Andy Finch, Chris Moss, Robert Sears, MD of San Juan Model Company and Grant Line Products, Sam Yates, Dale Williams, and Mo Henry. Thank you. Without you guys, I couldn't do this.